And for those of you who don't know me, I'm Jude England. I'm Head of Social Sciences here at the British Library. Um, and astonishingly, I realised that almost four years ago we embarked on this series of events um, we call Myths and Realities. Um, and I don't think we envisaged when we started that we'd be going four years and 19 events later. And in fact, this one is number 20, and it's our final one. So cue for ah. Oh. Um, <laughs> And thank you to all of you who've supported us, but I'll come on to that again in a minute. But the aim of this series has been to look at a whole range of significant and um, public and social issues. And the, the idea came about really through a collaboration between us, the Academy of Social Sciences, and the Economic and Social Research Council. And when we started in 2009, those were the days when we had a big, nice drinks reception afterwards because we hadn't been cut back in government <laughs> at that point. Um, but um, through the series, our aim has been to challenge some of the common assumptions that we make about our everyday lives and highlight the role that social science research can play to help us understand what's happening and why and point the way to how we might change and improve. And we really wanted to provide a forum for researchers um, who, for, to talk about their research to a wider audience that, than they would perhaps normally reach or regularly reach, and we wanted to give the public the opportunity to engage with academics and practitioners working in a range of different areas. And we've covered a huge range of topics, and we've got posters showing some of them um, over there. But we started with migration, we've looked at risk, class, crime and punishment, education and the property-owning democracy, food, diet and families, policy and social issues around welfare provision, young people and older generations, as well as discussing ethnicity and identity, sustainable lifestyles and the impact of social media. And just that list in itself says something about the beauty and the scope of social science, I think. And we've had a fantastic range of speakers, though some, who will remain nameless, were incredibly ambitious about the amount of ground they could cover in 25 <laughs> minutes or so. But whether they broke my two minutes a slide, and if you do PowerPoint, it works if you think about two minutes a slide, um, we're incredibly grateful to them to distilling their expertise and research, mostly in succinct, informative and illuminating packages. But what's, been, what's for me shone out all along has been the importance of evidence, evidence to understand and enhance our understanding of issues. That's what we set out to do. And in tonight's event, what we want to do really is sort of conclude by how, looking at why some people cling on to the social myths that we've discussed in the series, often in the face of strong evidence to the contrary. Why do those politicians, who also will remain nameless, prefer anecdote over evidence? And uh, why the general public overestimate benefit fraud, migration rates, population trends, and um, so on. Now, we're very honoured this evening that our chair is um, Dame uh, Janet Finch, who's Professor of Sociology at the University of Manchester. Her main research interest has been around the family and family relationships, but she's been involved in national-level uh, policy work on a number of issues. Most recently, she chaired a group on ac open access publishing and has become, I don't know, if, is it a noun? I don't know it's what you call it. A, a noun, man. because she's now referred to as the Finch Report. Um, <laughs> and, um, but she's also chair of, of the governing board of this fantastic new cohort study, birth cohort study, which will involve 100,000 babies. Just get your heads around that. 100,000 babies who are going to be born in 2014 and will try track them through their lives. So in 50 years' time, hopefully, my equivalent will be standing here introducing the latest results on that. Um, for light relief, she's chair of the Social Sciences Panel for Research Excellence Framework National Assessment, and that's looking at the research output of higher education institutions, which I think is a bit of a labour of love, actually. Um, but Janet's going to be keeping our two speakers in order and we'll be introducing them. And I'd like to welcome Professors Ivor Gaber and John Homewood. Two more things from me before um, we get underway. We're changing our focus next year. We haven't got rid of us yet. Um, we're going to do a new series, which we're debating what to call. We've thought about understanding our society. We've thought about, just tonight, discovering society. Um, we're still working on this, um, but we'll have the first one in June, um, and we're thinking about the sorts of topics. And one of the things we think about, it, we think we might do, is perhaps look at some of the theory around society and um, why we are the way we are, rather than the sort of issues. So let's have a look at some of the underpinning theory. Um, 
Before then, we're part of the events that will be going on for Science um, Week in March, and we have an event um, with that called Beyond Nature Versus Nurture. So are we born the way we are and stuck with it, or do we change as we go through? And that's on the uh, 11th of March. Um, just a technical thing, bear with us a bit on the technical issues this evening. There may be some feedback, and we are sorting this, um, but be please be patient. And I'm going to hand over to Janet now to get us underway properly and welcome our speakers. Th thank you very much, Jude. And on behalf of everybody who's been involved in these 20 events, I think I'd like to thank you very warmly for the way in which you have supported it and the library has supported it. And of course, Caridwin for the Academy of Social Sciences. It's been great. Um, so, but it, this is uh, the denouement of the series on myths and realities, and uh, will we get to the bottom of why people st stick on to, hold on to the myths uh, in, the, in the teeth of all evidence against them? Well, let's see where we get to by the end of the evening. It is something that I feel personally quite um, passionate about, because my uh, own research has mostly been about families, and particularly about kinship, about the broader family relationships and at least 30 years ago, more than that, I started working on it partly because I thought that we needed to unravel some of the myths about how people were no longer, it no longer mattered, the wider family relationships were no longer important to people. Um, despite the fact that my wonderful research demonstrated without any doubt whatsoever that this is not true and that kinship remains really important to most people in this country. Strangely enough, that myth is still alive and well. Um, and uh, despite the fact that very many other people, as well as me, have, have shown uh, that it's very much more complicated than that. So I think it is a genuine puzzle for social scientists as to how these myths persist in the teeth of all evidence against them. And I hope to learn a lot tonight from our two speakers. And I'll move straight away to introduce the first one, who is Professor Ivor Gaber. He is an academic who is also extremely well known um, as a practitioner in the media, as you may say, uh, uh, an independent producer now f of programs for Radio 4 and the World Service, but in the past has had senior editorial positions in the BBC, ITN, Channel 4 and Sky News. He's currently Professor of Media and Politics at the University of Bedfordshire and widely respected for his work on media and politics. And he's going to talk to us tonight um, about the topic, um, never let facts get in the way of the good story either. Thank you Thanks very much. much. As a journalist, it's difficult to resist wine. Um, as, as good evening. Um, as Janet's described my background, I, I like to think of myself as a recovering journalist, that uh, <laughs> one never finally lose, loses the journalistic imperative to tell a story, hopefully by letting the facts get in the way. But I have got a bit of a, res a, a, bit of a research background, so my talk tonight is going to be a bit of a romp from both a journalistic and a media perspective. I, can't, I have to start with the good and great Paul Dacre. It's a, and I chose that picture as all newspapers choose them to reflect an absolutely neutral and unbiased perspective on what I think of him. Why is the left obsessed by the Daily Mail? I'm going to start and end with the Daily Mail because they do, f do form a theme. There are metropolitan classes, and I fear that's you lot, of course despise our readers with their dreams mostly unfulfilled of a decent education and health service they can trust their belief in the family, patriotism, self-reliance and their overriding sus super suspicion of the state and the people who know best. These people mock our readers' our readers' scepticism over the European Union and the Human Rights Court that seems to care more about the criminal than the victim. They scoff at our readers who, while tolerant, fret that the country's schools and hospitals can't cope with mass immigration. Well, I'm proud that the ma mail stands up for those readers. And I just thought, Given the events of the last few weeks, it was impossible to do this talk without referencing the mail. But for those of you who find the mail difficult to take, you'll be pleased to note they, they only make an appearance at the end. Um, the overview, this is a very complex subject. Janet said she's hoping to learn much. 
I, this is a multi-causal explanation. Right? There is no single answer, and it takes in a whole lot of disciplines, psychology, anthropology, sociology, which John will be talking about, but also political science, media studies, contemporary politics, and current UK journalistic practice. By, by the way, when Jude said it's two minutes a slide, <laughs> I thought, <laughs> sometimes, so hold on, it might be a bit quick. So I'm going to only focus on the last the media studies, the contemporary politics, and the current journalistic practice. If you ask me to tweet, and it's not done as a tweet, why myths um, persist, um, I would summarise one of the major reasons, and I have to say in my experience and experience of colleagues I, I, I talk with, we do have a unique, unfortunate media and political culture in this country, perhaps imitated in Australia, where one, you might have noticed the civilised exchanges between the party leaders in the previous election and within parties, not dissimilar to some of our own politics. We do have a very adversarial political and media culture. And one reason, and I'm not going to history, but of course our, political, our judicial system and our political system is adversarial in nature. There aren't many political systems where the two sides do sit opposite each other. Most are hemispheres, and it's more than just furniture. There is a, a, an important symbolism there. We um, have one of the most concentrated media, cult me 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 media ecologies in the world. Um, and as you all well know, newspapers have very strong political opinions, and these political opinions suit many of the um, myths that um, Janet alluded to, which we'll, we'll, I will be referencing. <laughs> this is an unfashionable view, but my research, which I won't bore you, I will be touching on some of my research very briefly, but I am a, a, a believer that politicians in this country do have a very strong agenda-setting power. If I told that to a group of politicians, as I have on occasion, they just laugh. They see themselves as pawns of the media. Well, it ain't necessarily so. Politicians have the ability to put items to put issues on the agenda and to keep them there. Um, I, I hope you can all think of examples. I'm happy to discuss that in questions. Then we have a very problematic journalistic culture. Journalists have never been under greater pressure. Um, it's a process that I've described elsewhere as news intensification, that because of the culture we're now in the 24-hour social media culture, the pressures on journalists are horrendous. Um, and ever more so, which makes simple black and white solutions much easier than complexity. That's really what we're talking about. We're talking about simplicity against complexity. Um, and then we have audience expectations, the notions of hegemony, certain ideas, not only are current, that, that uh, get a hold in our society. And some of them are very, very difficult to dislodge, particularly when those with the ability to dislodge them choose not to. I'm going to do a quick... Um, trot across um, some of the myths about scroungers. It just seems, I was just looking for some, just to give you a flavour, oh, I beg your pardon. There are, an, I've, I've jumped, there are current myths, a lot surrounding youth and hoodies and so forth, problem, feral families, scroungers, which I'll talk about briefly, drugs, a lot of, I've worked, my first journalistic job was working uh, for a now long defunct magazine called Drugs and Society in the 1970s, and there were a lot of myths around there about drug taking which persist um, there's some very interesting work a long time ago done by um, a sociologist called Jock Young, which e exemplified that. Immigration, I don't need to tell you. Islam, Islamophobia, all of the stuff surrounding that. And there are a lot of myths. Uh, this is relative. The 60s has long been a myth. Um, if you can remember it, you weren't there. But the 70s, recently, there's a headline which I didn't use when Ed Miliband, the Daily Mail, said Ed Miliband's bringing back the 70s. Well, there were aspects of the 70s that were problematic in the extreme, but the notion of an entire 10 years were misery is one of the myths. But some, oh, and, and sorry, um, social workers and child protection, which is an issue I've been researching, there are a lot of myths surrounding that. Some myths go, fading fast and making a comeback. There were many myths surrounding AIDS, HIV. Fantastic educational work in that area has dispelled many, if not all, of the myths. There were many myths around homosexuality. Every time a child was attacked, it was a a gay pedo or whatever. Trade unions, that, that's a fading myth, although I'm sure um, the Conservatives will be doing their best to resurrect it. Do you remember all the dangerous dogs and the dangerous dogs act that came out of it? And it's, there are myths. So myths aren't stabilised. They're not all, all, all encompassing all the time, although some of them persist. They do sometimes move on. I was going to 
look at some myths about scroungers, the majority of welfare spending goes to those who aren't or can't be bothered to work. Um, Out-of-work benefits account for less than a quarter of welfare spending and just over half of spending on non-pensioner benefits. They live in families in which there are three generations who've never worked. How often have we heard that? In fact, a family in which three generations have never worked has yet to be unearthed by either social researchers or the media, despite their best efforts. And only an estimated 0.3% of families have two generations who've never worked. Wrong button again. They spend all their money on drink and drugs. Fewer than 4% of benefit claimants report any form of addiction. They're all on the fiddle. Less than 0.9% of the welfare budget is lost to fraud. If everyone claimed and was paid correctly, the welfare system would cost around £18 billion pounds more. And, la- yep? That's, that's because actually for fraud and error, where administrative error takes the vast... So it's an even bigger myth than I'm suggesting. Yes, it is. Thank you very much for that. <laughs> Life on benefits is a doddle. Over the last 30 years, benefits have halved in value compared with average incomes. And I hope, finally, Britain is the benefits capital of Europe. I'm grateful for this morning's Guardian for pointing out to me that EU nationals are net contributors to the UK welfare system. They pay more in tax and social security contributions than they receive in benefits. Although, as my wife pointed out, that's something to do with demographic makeup, but nonetheless, it is a fact. Um, So, however, it's not all in one direction. The Guardian, for example, shocked some of us when it had this table on cost of tax evasion. We assume that tax evasion is a mega problem here compared with elsewhere. And in fact, we don't do, very, don't do too badly in this table as, um, by Tax Justice Network and the World Bank, which puts us below Russia, Brazil, Italy, Spain, France and Germany in terms of loss to the exchequer by, benefit, by, by tax evasion. So I just wanted to point out, although clearly there is a bit of a political agenda going on here, it doesn't all happen one way. Some theories of news. I'm now going to... um, Theories of news. Um, This is a very classic definition of news, and I think behind this, um, from... I'm I'm told it's probably not, but everybody uh, attributes it to Lord Northcliffe, who owned the the Daily Mirror. News is what somebody somewhere does not want you to print. All the rest is advertising. But there's a fundamental truth in that, that news media don't exist fundamentally to give you the news. Even... Well, I'll come back... Their newspapers are there essentially to make a profit and they generate news to do that. Even the BBC um, needs to generate audiences to justify the licence fee. So attracting audiences comes before telling the news and the notion that there's such a thing as the news is very problematic but I won't go into that here. Three basic texts I want to draw your attention to. Walter Lippmann, who was an American journalist, in 1922 he wrote this book. He went on to write some very strange things but... His comment on the news, news and the truth, whoops, news and the truth are not the same thing and must be clearly distinguished. How many times do I hear journalists say, look, all we do is we we get the facts, we get the truth, and life's a bit more complicated than that. Um, Lippmann had this lovely analogy of of, uh, the press is no substitute for institutions. It is like the beam of a searchlight that moves restlessly about, bringing one episode and then another out of darkness into vision. Men cannot do the, world, do the work of the world by this light alone. And that notion that journalists are selecting, shining a light on the things that they're looking for is a very persuasive notion. So that's Walter Lippmann, 1922. Um, just moving forward very rapidly, and this is um, something that I'm familiar, familiar with. The most important work in this field, and the work that's probably shone the most light, was written by the late Stanley Cohen, 1972, in a a very important book called Folk Devils and Moral Panics. I fear there's a long quote coming in here, but this just summarizes, I could almost just read this and stop. He wrote, Societies appear to be subject every now and then to periods of moral panic. A condition, episode, person, or group of person emerges to become defined as a threat to societal values and interests. Its nature is presented in a stylized and stereotypical fashion by the mass media. The moral barricades are manned by editors, bishops, politicians and other right-thinking people. Socially accredited experts pronounce their diagnosis and solutions. Ways of coping are evolved or more often resorted to. The condition then disappears, submerges or deteriorates and becomes less visible. 
He was writing about the mods and rockers panic of the 70s, but it can be applied to virtually every other moral panic we've had since. He identified three key elements, exaggeration and distortion, a prediction of recurrence, that this isn't just a one-off, we have a, a problem, and then there's symbolization of a wider issue, usually moral decadence, breakdown of society. The final text I'm briefly going to refer to, who built on, uh, again, I'm familiar with so many of you, who built on Cohen's work is Policing the Crisis, which was written by Stuart Hall and others um, a few years later. And he came up with this very important notion of primary definers. And I suppose moral panics and primary definers are, for me, the key explanation of myths. Primary definers are the notion that certain elements in society are given greater credibility than others. Just to give you an example, a simple example from my days as a reporter, you go along to a demonstration, you say to the organisers, um, how many people do you estimate here? And they say 200,000. You go to the police and you say, how many do you estimate here? And they say seven, eight. I exaggerate. <laughs> and news editors would take the police version of numbers as authoritative. They might then add organisers claimed. Police never claim. Police say there were 20,000 present and organisers claim there were 100,000. And it's a preferred read. It's a very interesting notion, primary definers, that the media privilege certain definers. It's breaking down now, I'm just talking to you as the Metropolitan Police's explanation of um, plebgate collapses, um, and they, as a primary definer, are now very, very challenged, to put it at its mildest. But the notion of primary definer still, hold, still holds very strong, and it does give the establishment, to use a very problematic word, an advantage. So that enough of the theory, although it's not gone away. This is the Evening Standard a couple of weeks ago. The gangs of London, they, this was absolute sensationalist tripe they ran. But we have to examine the moat in our own eye. This was based on, quote, research, it was. Today we expose shocking new findings that show just how bad normal life has become for vulnerable young Londoners. The result of a study of a high risk of young people in South London reveals. First of all, we know it's not all Londoners, this is South London. And I, it's a wonderful place, I cast no aspersions on it. Um, and they said nearly half had seen a stabbing or shooting in the last year, and these were block capitals, as I'm portraying them. One in four had witnessed a killing, one in five themselves had been stabbed or shot. Those are truly shocking, fi shocking figures. And a cursory reading suggests this is what Londoners, normal life has become for young Londoners. But when you read the research, it's based on a study of 105 children, drawn from 18,000, being helped by the charity Kids Company, undertaken by researchers at the University of College London. Now, I'm sure this research at UCL is very good quality, qualitative research, based on a particularly troubled group, because Kids Company works with troubled group, and there's no, uh, based on my knowledge of quantitative methods, there's no way a sample of 105 can be representative. It can be, it's a, it's a large quantitative, qualitative sample, but it's certainly ain't quantitative. But you, well, you would know that, that was the bottom of the piece. But that really reinforces a lot of myths, and we have to exact, you know, at the moat in our own eyes as social scientists. My own work, interest in this area, I was involved in the Munro Review for, ch for Child Protection, which looked at child protection, and I was advising Professor Munro on the role the media plays in um, d different issues, Baby P, Victoria Columbia, so forth, these sort of issues. And um, it is a great. The, the notion of the demonised social worker um, is a great fit for a lot of the myths in our society. The whole of the, the story, why do these stories attract such attention? They just fit everything. They fit the scroungers and feral families discourse. Um, social workers' demonisation, which is an ongoing theme which I'm happy to discuss further. There is a hangover from the loony left of the notion that um, di you know, that the, the, the some local authorities have been too indulgent with um, people, or, or people who, 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 whose lifestyles most people disapprove. But children are newsworthy, there's no question. The murder of children, I'm not for one moment suggesting that the deaths of children, uh, looked after children, should not be a story, but children are particularly newsworthy. Much more newsworthy, for example, in the deaths of old people, and we know there's a lot of elder abuse as well, but it, you know, they don't make nice pictures. I mean, we could talk about Madeleine McCann and why that's such a big story. Oops, and then um, it's a classic moral panic, in fact. It has all the elements. Um, moving on, but, for, ex well, for example, uh, in this whole, what can I call it, epidemic of deaths of, child, of child abuse, 
it's a classic, never let the facts get in the way of a good story. Because in the middle of all this, in 2010, the Ju J British Journal of Social Work reported, child abuse related death rates have never been lower since records began. England and Wales have made significantly greater <coughs> progress in reducing violent child deaths than the majority of other major developed countries. And this message, this was research from, um, by Pritchard and Williams. The following year in The Independent, I picked up a thing, Archives of Diseases in Childhood, showed a equally, if not more, dramatic death. A, they're measuring different things, and I don't want to get two, but deaths from child abuse in 1974 was 152. In 2008, it was 51. So while, and th uh, children under one down from 36 to eight. So while there's this huge moral panic, this epidemic of problems of child abuse, actually the figures are moving in the opposite direction. And very briefly, my other case study, I also looked at the phenomena in a book called Culture Wars about the loony left and the way it was used to stereotype and categorise. Um, and stories, you, some of you older members will be familiar with Barmy Bernie, the late Bernie Grant. And the sort of stories we looked at is, you know, PC coffee, black bin liners band, no manholes in Hackney. Bar Bar Green Sheep is a fascinating one and a very brief diversion. When we researched why the Daily Mail Express, whoever reported, we tracked down the people and there was, I have to tell you, a nursery in Hackney where they were teaching the children to say Bar Bar Green Sheep. And when we or our researchers interviewed them, they said, why are you doing this? Have you had an instruction from the council? They said, no, but we've been reading the newspaper reports and we know that's the sort of thing they'd want us to do. <laughs> so it was a very interesting <laughs> amplification. <laughs> and it was a bit like, some other research I did <laughs> looking at media reporting of the introduction of congestion charging, those of you who were in London at the time will remember there was a really hysterical reporting of how Armageddon will come when we have the congestion charging. The Evening Standard started the story um, unsourced, they sourced it to a source in City Hall. And I have an eminent friend of mine here who's working in City Hall and, and, and actually commissioned the research, come to think of it. Um, they sourced it to a source in City Hall, and then for their subsequent 250 reports, they didn't source it to this anonymous source, they sourced it as, as exclusively revealed in the Evening Standard. So they became their own source. It was a rather clever trick. Anyway, I can't remember what comes next now. It's a fascinating headline. The times are changing. Yeah, going back to these myths, some of the myths of loony leftism or, 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 or canards have now become very mainstream, and that's just an example of the dynamism of myths, how they do metamorph, they can metamorphosize. Feminism, which was um, one, of the, uh, one of the key issues, anti-racism, gay rights, rights for disabilities, environmentalism, negotiating with the IRA, even public finance initiative, they're even selling off our town halls, was one of the headlines we looked at. Well, they beat Capita to it, but not by much. Um, these myths, so to speak, have become mainstream. Let me now just take you behind the scenes briefly. I picked up this advert in The Guardian for Sky News was looking for a social affairs and education editor, and this sort of sums up the problem. They want speed of coverage, exclusive news stories, sharp analysis, tight deadlines, very understandable, but original and imaginative, and complicated issues, and they don't all fit together, particularly when you're being asked to do a one minute 15 package explaining the complexities of a social phenomena. And it is a real problem. There are other problems, news intensification I've referred to, where news information is coming, both coming at journalists at ever increasing rates through social media and 24 hour news, but they're also having to output it at the same sort of rate. There are fewer staff doing it, there's a much more competitive media environment. Career aspirations mean that journalists don't say, no, I, can't, I won't write that, that's a myth. If you want to get on, you keep quiet and you do what you're told. This is a very well-known phenomenon that sociologists of the media have been observing for a long time, and it's, I suppose, pretty obvious. And then there's a newsroom culture. It remains a macho newsroom culture, where you don't go into complexity and explanation unless you're working on The Guardian, as they say. But in the mainstream media, in the popular press, and on, most, and on the TV channels, there tends to be a newsroom culture. The, the cliché is, if it bleeds, it leads. It's, that's slightly <laughs> clichéd, but, you know, ex explains quite a lot. There's another cliché, which is too good to check. <laughs> um, we've all been there. Now, I'm just going to, moving towards... Two minutes. Two minutes. Well, I want to pay my video. Can I have Sorry, three? Sorry, of course you can, yes. Yeah. 
Um, there's this notion of objectivity. There's this notion there is the news, there is the facts, we tell it truth. This is what is taught to every first-year journalistic student, the inverted pyramid. You start on the most important, the who, what, where, when, why, and how. The most important info goes first. It only takes 20 seconds of reflection to realise that deciding who is the most important person, what's the most important fact, is a totally, well it's not a totally, but it's a very subjective judgement. It involves all sorts of value judgments. So the notion that there is objectivity out there is, uh, many journalists are now realising it's not, although they do try and they say, well it's a gold standard, um, well some still say it's a gold standard, some say it's a worthy aspiration, and people like me say it's either a chimera or a chimera. Uh, it's a chimera, is it? Chimera. A chimera. That's what I say. It's a chimera. Um, there's some rather a couple of interesting American academics, journalist academics, who wrote objectivity is not a fundamental principle of journalism, merely a voice or device to persuade the audience of one's accuracy or fairness. And that's the key issue. Journalists, and particularly the Daily Mail, have the ability to convince people that they're giving them the facts straight that notion that there are the facts straight, and that's what makes it so persuasive. So, I'm just going to show you finally, this is a thing called response source, which I only came across in the process of researching it, but it's a, new, it's a PR service, and if you are a PR, you log on to that, you pay some money, and then hundreds of journalists get a note from you asking, we're looking for somebody, a woman who's tried to give birth a lot of times and has given up and has now gone into homeopathy or whatever. And I picked up this really nice one from The Sun, and it's true, this is in-depth reporting lesson one. This is how investigative journalists work, that's unfair. Further to my, whoops, further to my last request, this Sun journalist said, I also now urgently need an expert who will say tattoos can give you cancer. <laughs> We can plug any <coughs> relevant organisation, give copy approval, which journalists pretend to desperately resist, and pay a fee. Please get back to me as soon as possible if you can help. Well, for that, I'm prepared to, I, I'm prepared to be a tattoo expert if that, <laughs> the fee is big enough. But you can see the problem. So, I've, in this romp, I have conclude with this headline, British Press, Best in the World. And as somebody might have said, I don't believe it. But I, I, before, I'm, I'm now ending, but I don't want to leave without trying to resurrect the reputation of the Daily Mail, because I think I've been a bit unfair on the Mail and that ilk. And I'm going to end with a contribution um, that I would love to have claimed to have written, but didn't. And the, from, oh, it works. Oh, it almost worked. Paid swine flu and road rage. Fine laddie, foreign baddie, put him in a big cage. Bureaucratic red tape, Facebook gang rape. Gordon out, Dave in before the country caves in. Ian Huntley gets his own jacuzzi and a gym in jail. It's absolutely true because I read it in the Daily Mail. Bring back capital punishment for paedophiles Photo feature on school girls, skirt styles Binge Britain, single mums, pensioners Hoodie scum, oversexed and underage Foreign stories, half a page Criminals get marked suspensive vouchers When released on bail It's absolutely true because I read it in the Daily Mail Ban this gay smart, I'm not racist, but car crime, knife crime, hang the cheating wife time, pop stars take drugs, teen boys wear hoods, sports stars have sex, bear shit inwards, Brussels politicians want to stop us drinking English ale. It's absolutely true because I read it in the Daily Mail. Climate gate, petrol prices, potholes, credit crisis, gypsies, Russell Brand, time we all took a stand. Modern art, where to start, trashed a lot of it, apart from statuette, a puppy, 50 quid plus p and Muslim women hiding stolen goods behind their veil. It's absolutely true because I read it in the Daily Mail. Poles paid to give blood, immigration like a flood, soft touch, British arse, cancer from your mobiles, cancer from your laptop, cancer from your root crop, cancer from your shoes, from your dog, from your pen top, immigrants arriving on an unprecedented scale. It's got to be the case if it's written in the Daily Mail. 
they never mince their words in the good old Daily Mail. It's absolutely true, because I gather all my views from the Daily Mail. Thanks, Dan. Nice one. I'm just going to go and wash my hair. I would if I were you. Ida, thank, thank you very much indeed. Um, I don't know whether our next speaker is also going to have a comedy spot, <laughs> um, but I have seen him being very entertaining on a number of other occasions. <laughs> I'm delighted to introduce Professor John Homewood from the University of Nottingham, current president of the British Sociological Association, um, and a well-known commentator on the ways in which sociology in particular, scientific knowledge, social scientific knowledge more generally, can be of public relevance. Um, in order to put that into practice, he, I think, has become a practitioner in a slightly different sense recently as one of the joint managing editors of the new online magazine of social research called Discover Society, which I suspect he's going to talk about, but which the first issue was really good, I thought. That's my personal opinion. John, your turn. OK, I'm uh, not going to talk about it. Um, <laughs> Is it okay if I study? I'm not going to talk about it, and I'm not going to be entertaining, and uh, so <laughs> I'm really annoyed with, with, with Iva. And um, I suspect I'm going to go a bit off message, because I'm uneasy about these discussions about myths and ra realities and expertise. And I'll begin with um, a reference that uh, Iva made to Walter Lippmann. Walter Lippmann is also the author of a book called The Phantom Public. And the book, The Phantom Public, is about how the figure of the public occurs within democratic theory, but has no real substance in relation to the complexity of modern society, and that what we really need is a replacement of politics by experts, <coughs> and the social sciences, in a sense, represent themselves as that form of expertise. And I think it's very dangerous if we think about myths and realities in the context of expertise replacing uh, publics. And I think it's also a, an issue if we think and criticize the idea of privileged definers and then claim for ourselves the role of privileged definer. So what I want to do is actually think about the idea of expertise in the context of issues of democracy. It's the last in a series, so I thought, well, uh, reflect upon the series itself in the light of what it says about the public role of the social sciences. I also want to say something about an event I was at recently, and that's the launch of a new social science division at the Parliamentary Office of Science and Technology in September. It was a seminar about social science in Parliament improving <coughs> the evidence base for policy. And so what does that mean and how might we relate to it. And it's clear that I think what's intended is that evidence-based policy would be policy based upon an adequate understanding of society rather than on myths. And one of the things that's clear from the title of this particular seminar is that evidence-based policy would uh, be about understanding society. And to understand society, it might be necessary to challenge myths embodied in normal, everyday understanding. So what does it mean to kind of challenge myths? And the first thing I say is that the social sciences, or sociology in particular, didn't always think that the role of the social sciences was to challenge myths. So I'm not at all critical, you know, I'm not sort of hostile to the uh, things that are being represented about scroungers, about uh, welfare benefits and so on. But we used to think that myth had a positive uh, role. But now this idea of myth is that normal understandings are insufficient and serve the reproduction of social relations, which in some way we regard as problematic, and that in serving their reproduction, they do so through in some way failing to explain them. But myths, as I suggested, didn't always have negative connotations. From some perspectives, myths were positive. They used to be argued, for example, to serve the function of maintaining social identity and cohesion. People, sociologists, 
would sometimes refer to common values as being the cement of society. Now, I think what's interesting about the idea of common <coughs> values is that it's fallen into disuse within the uh, social sciences that there might be something inclusive which defines uh, membership, insofar as they're invoked, and the government, I think, has recently invoked common values, they're now suggested as that there are some whose understandings lie outside common values and that it's a basis of scapegoating some groups who don't believe what we believe, despite being members of our political uh, community. And I suggest that that might well be one myth that is current that we could dispel. But if so, it's an interesting myth because it's a myth promoted by government. And I suggest that one of the problems of contemporary democracy is that our governments lack an inclusive public interest. That is, that they don't regard the public from the point of view of an inclusive political community. And so one of the issues then is how do we provide evidence-based policy for a government which lacks an inclusive idea of the uh, body politic? And I'd say, well, that's one of the dilemmas we're in. So the presumed need to challenge myths suggests that they're dysfunctional, that they serve to reproduce something problematic. But then the issue is dysfunctional for whom or from whose perspective and whose task is it to dispel myths and how do we relate social sciences to that task and, I'm not going to say, and to the idea of uh, democracy. So the reference to realities implies that where there are myths, there's a possibility of warranted knowledge grounded in reality, that's myths and realities. And that this knowledge is secured by various kinds of practices that establish its claims to be authoritative and available as a form of expertise. And this suggests another kind of distinction between knowledge and belief, but it also suggests the possessors of knowledge and, and uh, those who are merely uh, representing belief. So we have knowledge and they have beliefs, I think, is part of what is going on in that distinction. So, well, that's kind of a difficult distinction be, uh, to make. And it's also only a distinction that can be made in the context of what really underlies it, and that's an idea of disputed knowledge claims. So, in calling somebody else's claims belief as opposed to knowledge, we are both, in a sense, implicitly implying a difference a cognitive difference between the nature of our claims and then pushing aside the idea that their beliefs might themselves contain a form of knowledge which we would have to engage with as knowledge. So we've already, in a sense, separated ourselves from the, the, the process of understanding it, although I would suggest we risk that kind of separation. And perhaps, you know, that kind of knowledge, distinction between knowledge and belief is relatively unproblematic in many areas of life. And the myth we tell in the social sciences, or the story we tell to get this going, is the story of medical expertise. So we have a strong interest in the idea of medical expertise, that the person who might be, who'd be treating us is a, a, an expert, and indeed, we sanction all kinds of regulations to ensure that kind of expertise. And we tell us that story because it's a favourable story for setting up that our expertise might uh, uh, be like it. And that's a story about trust in the institutions by which expertise is reproduced. And one of the problems is how we maintain that trust. But I think it's dangerous to base the idea of social scientific expertise on a medical model. And uh, because most social scientific expertise is not like medical knowledge, where we might think that the interest of the physician and patient tend towards an alignment. But I don't really think that medical knowledge is like that either. And one of the reasons why it's a bad thing to use the argument about medical knowledge to justify, to say there's a common sense way in which expertise and the alignment of the expert and the, uh, the person on behalf, on whose behalf the expert speaks, is because uh, although you don't want to be operated on by an unqualified doctor, 
that deliberately obscures the controversies that arise within medical expertise, especially in the context of perceived professional interest or in the mobilization of knowledge claims as a form of disruption to facilitate institutional change. And I think at the moment we're living in a particular form of the mobilization of knowledge to uh, disrupt and to fac facilitate institutional change. For example, the representation of variations above and below an average number of hospital deaths as an indication of unnecessary deaths. That's a piece of social scientific knowledge that is mobilized. It's mobilized to have disruptive consequences. And of course, anybody can recognize that some hospitals have to be below average, and there is no way of representing being below average as involving, unnecessar as involving unnecessary deaths. Otherwise, it would remind, there was an MP, I remember back when uh, uh, MPs were interested in raising workers' wages, who said he would not rest until every worker in Britain had above average <laughs> wages. <laughs> and it's almost as if we won't rest until every hospital is on above average. But that's a mobilization of expertise in a context of disruption. And I think it's a situation where there is a, a public interest in actually questioning the nature of the expertise and the values that it is putting forward. It's worth, I think, uh, you know, just at this moment, so I'm you know, suggesting that that form of uh, mobilization of knowledge is on behalf of particular kinds of neoliberal claims about uh, markets. Well, uh, Walter Lippmann was a founding member of the Mont Pelerin Society, otherwise known as the, or Philip Morosky calls it, the thought collective uh, of uh, uh, the neoliberal thought collective. So expertise has a uh, relation to particular kinds of elite formations and in the social sciences we ought to uh, uh, remember that. So what I'd say is that most social scientific claims actually bear upon areas of public policy which affect all citizens but do so differentially. They pair upon the values and opinions of citizens and most think, people think they have a right to those opinions or at least to have right to having them expressed and debated, and that it's a function of democracy to do so. So I would say, well, we risk expertise getting in the way of one of the functions of democracy, which is the ability to express opinions, debate, and so on. Of course, the Daily Mail notwithstanding. So let me return to the post-launch event. Uh, Janet was there, and she will pick me up if I misrepresent it. Of course, I'm telling anecdotes about it. Um, <laughs> but uh, what was striking in the arguments there for the public relevance of the social sciences and evidence-based policy, there was not a single mention of democracy. In the mother of parliaments, not a single person in the room mentioned democracy, except as a joke. So MPs who were keen, uh, who were at the event and were keen on evidence-based policy heard the division bell and said they had to leave to exercise their democratic function. The irony of going to attend a WIP at the same time as committing yourself to evidence-based policy was uh, lost upon them, voting despite the evidence, presumably or notwithstanding any evidence. But there was mention of other MPs accepting myth and anecdote in a prejudicial way, as opposed to the correct mobilization of expert opinion. But why might any MP do that? Presumably because of the pressure of the public, their constituents who have these opinions. And so I'd say, well, actually, there is a dangerous technocratic argument going on here in the idea of expertise and uh, this was reflected in some of the ways in which evidence-based ba policy might operate. So one thing that was said was, wouldn't it be good if social science determined what works? People have heard the what works uh, initiative. With the assumption there that there would be agreed aims or that the task of setting the aims could be left to a political process that did not make, make the means part of the issue. And as one speaker put it, let's take the politics out of policy. Right. And, the, and the, there 
is, the politics is being taken out of policy very dramatically at the moment. It's being taken out of policy by the marketization processes because anything that is subjected to the market no longer becomes part of uh, a matter of public debate and public uh, policy. But not only that, what is happening at the moment is the marketization of the holding of government to account. So the NHS above and below average operated by Dr. Foster is a commercial exercise. Right? So we have the commercialization of holding to account which actually takes the market outside something that is to be held to account. And what social scientists seek to do is represent themselves as the embodiment of expertise that can, in a sense, serve um, the um, uh, <coughs> governments. So, if I just return to one of the ideas I had at first, I said, well, in any situation we're inclined to divide knowledge and opinion, I put to you we're dealing with a disputed knowledge claim. If we accept a common fallibility of knowledge claims, that is, social scientific claims as well as public uh, claims, then potentially the answer to that uh, issue of a disputed knowledge claims is communication and dialogue, widening, not narrowing the range of interlocutors. And the great John Dewey who challenged Lippmann, that was Lippmann's response. That was Dewey's response, not experts, but publics. And that means expertise in the service of publics rather than government. So let me give an example. It's often demonstrated that those with no direct experience of ethnic diversity overestimate both its extent and any supposed problems with which it's associated, compared with those who live amidst it. The solution to myth here would seem to be not just uh, not uh, simply uh, affecting policy, but to expand interaction and communication. But isn't the problem with evidence-based policy and the division of myth and reality that it encourages experts to narrow their own interactions and communication? Not so much putting truth to power, but talking about truth with power. Seems to be a what a lot of uh, evidence-based policy is about. And isn't this what delegitimates expertise? that it sees democracy as the problem, not part of the solution. Isn't that the small, and I admit it's a tiny, tiny truth within Paul Dacre's claim that we don't trust the public enough? So I'll finally end on one striking feature of our time. Because if we're to talk about expertise and how knowledge is produced, and if we're to talk about facilitating public debate, then universities themselves are one of the key sites for the production of knowledge and the facilitation of democratic debate. What is their public role if not that? So isn't it ironic that there's a massive program of the marketization of higher education without experts and universities asking for its evidence base? Instead, most academics are following the money. John, thank you very much for some very provocative ideas. So we've got some really rich concepts now which have been sort of explored during the, uh, the, the two speakers' presentations as knowledge, expertise, democracy, trust, myth. And reality, I guess, is the one that's the really difficult one to grasp. Myths and reality is the name of the whole series. Reality is probably the one that it's most difficult to talk about, and particularly what we mean by reality as social scientists and the contribution of social science to uh, reality and, and uh, understanding it.